Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday night Torah class of inspiration. Uh, we always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem's going to give to us. Please give generously so Hashem can give you and your families generously. So I'm going to start off with some coins. This class is dedicated tonight to a, a sister shlucha, Henya, Henya Bas Bracha Dvora. She needs prayers and a complete refuah shalema. So if everyone can please keep her in your prayers. A shliach shmuel ben bracha tirza, a personal friend that I just recently got to know who joins the class. She's she's an attendee and she's a shlucha. Uh, her name is Devor Leia Bas Yafa Liba. She should have a complete refuah shalema, and she feels that all the prayers that everyone does for her is really helping her get along and Hashem should help her um, and that she should pass this test without having to do any more hard work of treatments and she should just feel good and she should live till Mashiach and with Mashiach in a healthy and happy way. And we can't wait to celebrate the amazing news of your full healing very, very soon. Amen. Um, and I'm so inspired. Amen. Amen. I'm so inspired by her. She inspires me every week to continue. And she tells me how this class really gives her strength. So if everyone can please write down on a paper, Devorah Lea Bas Yafaliba for a complete refuah shalema. We're also Amen. dedicating this class tonight to my dear neighbor from growing up, uh, Razi Malamid Razel Bas Adas. She should have a complete refuah shalema. Um, and tonight's class is dedicated to a really, really special person who's no longer with us today in this world, but he's here in a spiritual form, and it's his yard site today. His name is Chaim Tzvi Ben Eliyahu, Eliyahu Akiva. He is uh, the speaker's uncle and uh, the guest speaker for the, for the story's brother and my aunt and uncle's brother. And his neshama should have the highest aliyah. I asked Sheva, can you tell me the, his mitzvah that he really, you know, everyone has their mitzvah that they're really into. And he said his mitzvah was obviously Yisrael, loving a fellow Jew. And someone once came to two rabbis and they said, teach me the Torah on one foot. And one of them wasn't really able to help it, but the other one said, via hafta l'reacha kamocha. So your brother's neshama should have the highest aliyah, and we should see him. We should see him down here so soon with the coming of Mashiach. Amen. Um, I also heard amazing things about him. There was a quote growing up with him that my cousins used to used to share um, every year on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish Jewish New Year. I would get a message: the best of last year should be the worst of this year. I'm going to say that again: the best of last year should be the worst of this year. What a man. Um, I can't wait to meet him very soon with the coming of Mashiach. I'm just smiling just from that line. And I really keep that with me. I also want to dedicate this class to my dear grandmother, who I love very much, who inspired me my whole life. Rifka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda. I hope you're proud. We're going to introduce to you our guest speaker. Um, she's a shlucha and a mother and a guest and a and a renowned speaker she she uh, she'll tell us a little bit about what she does um i want to introduce to you if you could unmute yourself leah rosenfeld thank you for being here tonight tonight we're going to be talking about don't let the lights go out you hear me i hear you all right <clears throat> We hear you and we see you. Thank you for having me, Chaya. Sorry, my voice is a little bit hoarse, but I'm so happy to be here. I heard all about this class and I'm so honored that I get to participate in it tonight. And it's an incredible thing that you're doing and all the schosim should really help all the people who you're doing it in honor of and in their schos. I, um, I chose the topic or we, we chose the topic of Hanukkah because I find that when all the eight candles are lit on the Menaira, it's this beautiful, warm, thrilling feel feeling. There's this buildup, this eight days of anticipation. There's so much light, there's so much joy, there's so much celebration. For many people, they're celebrating with family. 
but there's also this ping of sadness. You know, so let, so Leia, days, before, Leia, before we continue yeah. with, because you just introduced the uh, topic, which I wanted you to do, we're going to share a quick few minute video sure. of what you're going to be talking about tonight. So stay tuned. Everyone could look at the screen. I was so curious about him. Having my dad rave about the Lubavitcher Rebbe from the time I was born. Here I am, an American born college boy, sitting, and there's the Rebbe right there. He asked me what I do, and I said, uh, Gates of College. I'm going for a master's degree, and I'm taking up teaching. And he said, Ich habe gegangen in College, Eichet. And I said, what did you study? No, he said, my field was electrical engineering. He said, but I preferred to turn the lights on in people's souls. <laughs> Every person has a soul, a Yiddish in the summer, and it's like a spark, like a flame. When I went home, he said, he would like, if I could, to form groups of young people in one way or another, social activities, religious activities, bring them in to Jewish life, see that that pilot light or that flame is lit, brightening it, illuminating it. Thanks for sharing. Okay, so um, Leia, I'm gonna ask you to continue. Thank you, that was beautiful. And that's exactly what we're gonna speak about, how the Rebbe trained us that these lights, that sometimes when they're all lit and we start feeling that sadness creeping in because the menorah is not gonna be lit tomorrow or the next day, we have to come up with a method that we can take Hanukkah with us the rest of the year, keep her lights burning strongly through uncovering the inner spiritual meaning of this special holiday. And we're actually taught that every single day, special day, every single holiday, a new light from Hashem comes into the world. So for example, Rosh Hashanah 5783 was way more powerful than the first time it happened in the beginning of creation because every single year, a new light comes into the world in addition to all the lights that came in with that holiday in the previous year. So this Hanukkah had the most powerful light that Hanukkah ever had since the miracle of the oil happened in the year 139 BCE, which was almost 2,200 years ago. Now, what's interesting about Hanukkah is that in the 21st century, many Jewish holidays have become widely cultural in America. Some more known, some less known, but and they're obviously all associated with food. Even Yom Kippur, I live in a pretty secular community. The most popular part of Yom Kippur is the breakfast party. So we like to associate with food, with culture. And of course, that's beautiful because every Yom Tov is a time to celebrate with family, with friends. But why? And more importantly, how can we utilize that special energy so that we can make these days more meaningful, more growth oriented? And so that we can feel their light burning all year round, all year round. So the way that we can do that is by taking the time to learn. And thank you, Chaya, for giving us this opportunity right after Hanukkah to really learn what its message is, because it's a message, as the Rebbe says, that's relevant all year round, that's going to light us up all year round and actually change Hanukkah for us next year, because when we come into it, we'll almost feel that our proverbial candles are already lit. And it's definitely one of my favorite holidays, not because of the donuts or latkes, those definitely add, but because the messages of Hanukkah really 
touch the core of my soul. They really uplift me. And there's never too many days of Hanukkah. Whereas the other holidays, sometimes when they're coming to an end, they were beautiful, but you're ready for it to end. When Hanukkah comes to an end, you want more because its story and its messages are so incredibly uplifting and light-filled. So in short, just, just in short, the story in a nutshell is the, Greek fought the, Jew, the Greeks fought the Jews because they weren't happy with the way the Jews were practicing their Judaism. There was this great miracle and the tiny Jewish army miraculously won thousands more Greeks. And then the Jews went to reclaim the Holy Temple and the oil that had the signature of the high priest and was used to light the menorah was desecrated. So what are they gonna do? They searched and searched and they found one small jug of oil that was supposed to last for one day and it lasted for eight. Eight days was the amount of time it took to get a new shipment pure olive oil. Interestingly enough, Hanukkah is probably the most Jewishly culturally celebrated holidays. And that way of celebrating Judaism was exactly what the Maccabees were fighting. Because unlike other times in our history, where there was Pharaoh who wanted to diminish our number by throwing the baby boys into the water, or Haman who wanted to kill all the Jewish people, all the way down to Hitler who had, if you had a percentage of Jewish blood in, in you, he felt that you were part of the final solution. All many, many times in our history, our enemies were seeking to eradicate our bodies. They wanted to destroy us. During the time period of Hanukkah, second century BCE, the Greeks didn't mind if we were culturally Jewish. They didn't mind the Jewish people. It didn't bother them if we kept traditions because they made sense to us. It didn't bother them if we learned Torah because we appreciated the knowledge, even if we appreciated it as a, as a spiritual pursuit as song, as philosophy. They didn't care if we did the mitzvot that made us feel good because the Greeks appreciated the Jewish people. They appreciated our wisdom. They appreciated our creativity. They appreciated our passion to create change, our, our, our passion to revolutionize. They understood that thousands of years later, while the Jews would represent 0.2% of the population, they would represent 22.4% of the Nobel Prize recipients because we have this inner desire to move and shake. And they were happy to celebrate that. They did not want to eradicate our bodies. The issue for the Greeks was that we learned Torah because it connected us to God and that we did mitzvot even if we didn't understand it, even if we didn't want to. We did it just because it was God's mitzvot and, and God's Torah. The, the, um, the foundation of the Greek belief system was to give supremacy to nature without any involvement of God or anything above nature. Their idea was that there's nothing that exists beyond nature. And that's why they glorified the body. That's why they glorified the wisdom of man. And now we can understand why they specifically annulled three specific mitzvot. Shabbat, because the whole idea of Shabbos is that Hashem created the world in six days and he rested on the seventh. Hashem created nature, and then he rested on the seventh day, and he wants us to understand that not everything is nature. That was against the principles. Nature is supreme. They annulled Brit Mila, circumcision, because they felt that that was an assault on the body, which they glorified. How can you say that we have to correct the way that nature created their body? And they also, one of the mitzvahs that they said that the Jewish people can't do was um, sanctifying the new month through the moon, because that mitzvah also transcended what they felt was man's wisdom, because instead of giving credence to the philosophers, to the astronomers who saw the moon from the natural perspective to decide when a new month begins and when it ends, the setting of the new month really depended on the sages, more than astronomy, more than man's wisdom. And again, they wanted us to function vis-a-vis -vis nature. In the special prayer that we say every single day of Hanukkah in the Amidah prayer, and, in, and when we bench after we eat, is the Baal Anisim prayer. And in that prayer, it says that the Greeks wanted us, which means they wanted us to forget your Torah, God. 
They didn't mind if we studied Torah. They, they loved wisdom. They loved philosophy. They even loved like you felt spiritual doing something. They didn't want us to connect to the divine. They didn't want us to know that it's your Torah, God. And then it says, They wanted us to turn away from your mitzvot, God. You did a mitzvah because it felt culturally acceptable? Great. You did a mitzvah because you understood it? Don't kill, don't kill, don't steal? Perfect. But don't do mitzvot that you don't understand. Purity, impurity, the laws of mikvah? Who decided what's pure, what's impure? For them, that was an assault on their way of life. And that's what they wanted to abolish in the Jewish people. They fought against holiness. They despised the Jewish people's relationship with God, with Hashem. They wanted us to be culturally Jewish, not divinely Jewish. And that actually answers a basic question about the miracle of Hanukkah. Because if the Greeks were opposed to the Jewish people lighting the menorah, why didn't they just destroy all the oil? Why did they defile it? Why didn't they come in, take the oil and smash it? Why did all they did was remove the seal of the high priest, the kosher symbol? That makes no sense because oil represents wisdom. And the Greeks wanted us to light our precious holy menorah with defiled oil to show there's no such thing as purity and impurity. This oil is pure, this oil is not pure. That's above nature. We don't buy into that. And that's why they only desecrated the pure olive oil. They didn't destroy it because they don't mind if we use it. They don't, they don't care if we light the menorah as long as it's not connected to purity, as long as it's not connected to godliness. They were okay with the Jewish people being culturally Jewish and not being connected to the holiness of our religion. Now we see that wasn't okay because the Maccabees fought back, even though it seemed like there was no chance for them to win. They were few against many, and not just in a small way, in a drastic way, a few people against thousands. But they fought back with self-sacrifice because they knew that it was impossible to be a Jew without God. Judaism is not a culture. It's a connection to Hashem. It's a connection to the divine that's beyond understanding, that's beyond human reasoning. Interestingly enough, uh, we're, the Jewish people were actually allowed to use the impure olive oil because some laws, certain laws of purity become negated for the sake of the congregation. So if there's no pure olive oil, they were allowed to use the impure olive oil. So why did Hashem do this incredible miracle of causing the pure olive oil to last for eight days and nights? Because it was important when they did that search to find that small jar of pure and holy olive oil, it showed that this was the war that they were fighting, a war that represented the power of nature on the Greek side and the power of the divine on the Maccabee side. And in the case of this specific war, even though a technicality would allow it, because that's what they were fighting in the first place, they were only able to use this pure olive oil. And Hashem, need, sorry, Hashem needed to make this miracle because they needed to display this absolute connection to Hashem. And that's why the miracle of the eight days and nights of Hanukkah began. And that's why we still celebrate Hanukkah thousands of years later, because it's always worth fighting for holiness. There were actually Jews at that time who felt it wouldn't be so terrible to integrate with the Greeks and their philosophies. But the Maccabees knew that if we still wanted to be here, be around over 2000 years later, Judaism needed to be intimately connected to God. Cultural Judaism would be swallowed up like every other culture of the past, the Greeks, the Romans, they're all gone. We have to be unapologetically Jewish. We don't have to try to be like everybody else. We don't have to try to dress like everyone else, look like everyone else, talk like everyone else. We have to celebrate our identity. We have to connect to it in the deepest of ways. Specifically not feeling the need to be like them is what gives the Jewish people power is what keeps our Hanukkah lights burning. And it's so relevant because we live our lives and sometimes we get so into the motion of doing things, so into the routine. And even when we're doing something holy or Jewish, we don't take the time to think who and what we're doing it for. 
It could even be a prayer. I once was discussing with my students. I teach in a Jewish girls' school. And you know how many of you prayed today, went through the entire prayer, and didn't think about Hashem even once? And girls raised their hand because we get so much into the routine, into the culture, into the way of doing it, which is great. We can go through the whole Hanukkah or a whole Shabbat and not think about why are we doing this? What are we celebrating? What's my connection to the divine? The Maccabees taught us that there, this needs to be at the forefront of our minds. And only then, when we connect every action that we do, when we integrate God into every moment of our lives, when we connect to the divine peace inside of us, then we can keep these pure and holy flames, the holy flames, not the cultural flames, the holy flames of the menorah burning all year long. And this topic, even though Hanukkah was two, a couple days ago, is so relevant to a special holiday that we're celebrating tonight. Tonight is a very special day in the Chabad Lubavitch calendar. A few weeks ago, we celebrated the 19th of Kislev, which was the release of the Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad movement from prison. Uh, during that time, there were both personal attacks against him and attacks on the movement, and his release is a huge day of celebration. Hey, Tavis, in my mind, is like the Alter Rebbe, is our Rebbe's 19th of Kislev. In, uh, just to give a, sh a brief history for those who are not familiar, in 1985, they realized that some books were starting to go missing from the Aguda Hasid Chabad Library, the library um, under the auspices of the Rebbe. And after putting up videos, they realized that it was a cousin of the Rebbe who was taking these books and uh, selling them. They were you know, worth a lot. And he claimed that it was a family inheritance and he has every right to take them. They tried resolving this matter in a rabbinic court, but he did not want to show up there. So it ended up in federal court. And it was a very painful time for the Rebbe, um, watching the videos of those times of the Rebbe speaking literally gives you the chills um, where the Rebbe says, I really didn't want to get involved in this. I'm not a lawyer. I never wanted to be a lawyer. But as the trial unfolded, it, it was clear that this wasn't just an attack against the movement. It actually challenged the Rebbe's leadership, and Jewish leadership in general. And the questions that were being asked in the secular court case exactly mirrors these ideas of Hanukkah. They were asking, what is a Rebbe? What's a Rebbe's life? Is it a physical life? Is it material? Is it spiritual? So many questions along those lines, and all these questions really revolved around the ownership of these holy Jewish books. Are these Jewish books just cultural artifacts that we're going to sell to the highest bidder, or are these Jewish books divine? What was truly at stake here was holiness, showing what divinity really means, showing what the Torah books really are for, and in the end, holiness won. These are not just objects. These books are our connection to Hashem. And in fact, the call of action after winning this trial on the 5th of Tavis in 1985 was not to store these special artifacts in hiding, but the Rebbe insisted that everyone should buy more books, learn more. And until today, that is primarily how Hey Tavis is celebrated. In addition to Hasidic gatherings, doing exactly what we're doing now, learning, growing, and being inspired, it's buying books, Torah books, and recognizing the holiness in them. These are not just expensive or antiquated pieces of art. These are holy, divinely inspired books that are meant to be learned and guide our lives. There's actually an, um, an image that fondly stands out in my mind, in my childhood memories, that no matter what time I went to sleep at night, my father would always be in his study with an open safer, a Jewish book of study or several open books. And he was always immersed in the words of Torah, no matter what time I went to sleep. And now as an adult, whenever I have the privilege of spending the night in my parents' home, which doesn't happen often, the picture remains the same. Obviously he has a few more white hairs in his beard. And sometimes he's learning alone. Sometimes he's on the phone answering a question to one of the many people who admire his vast knowledge in Torah, but he still sits in front of his open books with the same passion for learning that I witnessed as a child. 
And one of the many things that he taught me without saying a word was that the Torah is alive. It has feelings, it has emotions. We have to respect it. We have to show it love. But most importantly, we have to learn it and, and live by its values. And even though his extensive Jewish library always had to be in pristine order, and if you borrowed a book, you had to put it back exactly where you found it because he knew where each one of his hundreds of books in his library belonged and he knew if one was missing. But he never minded if the books looked worn, not from being mishandled, but from being learned. Because he didn't want these books being left untouched and gathering dust on the shelves. These books were meant to be opened, to be used, and to be studied. They were not meant to be cultural artifacts. They were meant to be divinely inspired, the purpose, the meaning behind their lives. When the previous Rebbe came to the United States from Russia, he was actually told that he has to catch up with the times, America is not Russia, and the Torah of old should be placed on a shelf. It should be reserved for old time Judaism, the shtetl style Judaism. But we in America, we have to look like them exactly what the people were saying in the times of the Greeks. We have to modernize ourselves. We have to modernize our Judaism to fit in with the new, more cultured world. And he uttered four Yiddish words, which still reverberate today. He said, America is nisht andresh, which means America is not different. The Torah is truth, and truth is eternal and does not change with the times. And the Torah that God gave Moshe on Har Sinai over 3,000 years ago is the same Torah I heard my father learning as a little girl. And I'm grateful to Hashem that I married a man who my children here studying that very same Torah as they go to sleep at night. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to be in my parents' home to celebrate an all-girls birthday party of a close friend of the family. And in the middle of the party, I got an important phone call. So I went to my father's study because I wanted to avoid all the new noise in the other room. And my father was also on the phone. He was learning with somebody and there were quite a few svarim, quite a few books open on his desk. And as I conversed on my phone call, I watched my father take out more books down from the shelf, point out different verses and explanations, you know, with the same excitement, with passion. He was talking about it like, like this is his life. And this topic that he was discussing with the person at the other end of the line was literally taking over that he barely noticed that I was in the room. And as I was finishing up the call, he looked up and he saw that I was sitting there. So he said to me, by the way, I'm on the phone with your son, Ellie. Ellie's my oldest son. And nachas is the only word that could adequately, adequately describe the emotion that I felt. Because at the time, Ellie was studying in yeshiva in Chicago. But at that moment, I was transported back to my childhood. And I felt that Ellie was right there with me, learning Torah from my father. This perpetuity of the Torah, the love for the Torah, passion for the Torah, the holiness of the Torah was being passed down to the next generation. And that is the message of Hanukkah. That is the message of Hey Teves. If we just light the menorah for eight days and then forget about it, we're missing the point. If we just celebrate Hey Teves and don't actually purchase a book and learn it, we're missing the point. Judaism, Judaism is not a culture. It's a connection to the divine, celebrated by the fact that Hashem placed himself right inside of us and wants us to connect to that piece of the divine at every opportunity. If we celebrate Judaism as a culture, we're losing out on the infinite opportunity that we have to connect to the divine, to connect to the infinity, to connect to Hashem. At every opportunity we have, every moment of our lives, we can light those flames, those Hanukkah flames. It actually says the candle of Hashem is the soul of man, ner Hashem nishmat adam. Because we keep the candles burning by when we eat, say a bracha and use the energy to do good things, we keep the candles burning. When we earn money and we give a portion of it to tzedakah, to charity, we're keeping the candles burning. 
when we take a little bit of extra time to add prayer in our day, we're keeping the candles burning. So really, the Hanukkah flames that we light for the eight days, that's just symbolic. It's a beautiful mitzvah, but it's symbolic of the true candle, which exists in every single Jew, which we have the opportunity to light up every single day of the year, every single moment of our lives. And through that, truly uplift and light the world. So that next year, when we light those eight candles, we don't feel sad that Hanukkah is over. We just realize that the opportunities to create light, to bring light, to spread light into the world are just beginning. And I hope that we can take the message of Hanukkah, of Hey Teves, and truly connect to the real message, to the inner message of these days and feel the divine heart piece of us and light up our lives, our family's lives and light up the world. Thank you, Chaya, for having me. And thank you for dedicating this class to in memory of my uncle. I'm sure his neshama is having a great aliyah knowing that so many powerful Jewish women are studying Torah on his yard site. And it's a gift that you were able to organize this in his honor. Thank you so much for sharing. It's an honor, Leah, to have you um, tonight. And how appropriate that you are the guest speaker tonight on your uncle's yard site. We have 72 ladies on the class tonight. And his neshama should have the highest aliyah. They say when someone comes down to this world, they live 70 or 80 years just to do a favor for another. And surely tonight, we're going to all take on something in memory of Chaim Tzvi Ben Eliyahu Akiva. Um, so his neshama could reach the highest realms, which I'm sure it is, but every deed that we do down here helps our, our ancestors, our loved ones upstairs. And I hope that very soon we'll see him very soon with the coming of Mashiach. You also mentioned about the Torah, which was amazing and books and holy books. I'm just going to mute. That's okay. Um, and I just wanted to say that they say that if you protect the Torah, the, the Torah is going to protect you. And that's very, um, tonight, I just wanted to share that beautiful quote that I heard. If you protect the Torah, the Torah will protect you. I also wanted to share that many of the Sfarim that we got back on Hey Teves, tonight's Hey Teves, it's a, it was a big celebration. It still is. There's uh, Hasidic gatherings going on. This is a year of Hakel. Hakel is a time when all the, all the Jewish people uh, men, women, and children gathered in the times of the Beis HaMikdash. And every seven years is a year of Hakel. And we're meant to uh, gather. And this is what we do weekly. We gather. We have a Hakel, a gathering of, we learn Hasidic and uh, Jewish uh, topics. And I hope that you're going to take this with you in your own homes and share it with your friends and make your own Hakels and your own gatherings in your own life. Um, I also wanted to let you guys know that in 770 today, there is a library. It's fascinating. I had the opportunity to visit. I actually have a connection um, there. And the guy, that the rabbi that runs the library is a friend. And if anyone would like to come to Crown Heights to visit the library, we can organize a beautiful uh, Crown Heights walk. And you guys can go buy books. But this, this week on all the websites and all the uh, websites, bookstores in Crown Heights, Judaica World, Hamifitz, uh, there's, there's a couple. Um, you can reach out or you can come visit and there's 40% there's off, 50% off, 10% off, off amazing, amazing books. And in the chat box, I put a couple of my favorite books that I recently um, came across and there's many more that I love. So if you want some more recommendations, please reach out. Um, it's a custom and it's a the rabbi recommended that everyone should buy books for their homes, for their schools. Uh, today, I took my two-year-old class. I'm a teacher, and we went on a walk. I asked all the parents. I wanted to make it meaningful to send in money. They got a choice of three books, and we walked with these cute little two-year-olds to the bookstore, and we bought books for them to take home and we could start them young. So please buy anyone in your life, children. It's all about the children. If you have a child, you can buy them a book. You have a niece or nephew or students or 
just for your husband or your loved ones, your mom, buy books today. It's really great. And it will add a lot of meaning in your life. And like Leah said, don't just put them on your shelves, but actually read them because the Torah has all the answers. I know that today everyone's very into looking into healing and outside sources, but we have to remember that if we, we, we have the sources, we have, it's in our hands and it's in the books, in the holy books, all the answers that we need. Um, so tap into it if you can. Uh, I would like to, uh, we're going to have one of my favorite people tonight, someone I love. She knows that. Um, she's the bro- the sister of uh, Chaim Svi, who passed away. Uh, Sheva Shokha is going to share uh, an amazing, beautiful, personal Rabbi story that he had with the Labavitcher Rabbi. And we always like to share a story of inspiration because when you connect to Tzaddik, the Tzaddik connects to us. And the Rebbe said that all his teachings that he left us and all the letters that he left for others, it's really for all of us. So I hope um, you can get inspired this, by the story like I did. And um, Sheva, if you could unmute yourself. Shava, we just need to unmute. Give us one second. I think yeah. I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? Mm-hmm. I'm from the old century, so uh, and I'm doing this on my phone. So first of all, Chai, I want to thank you. And I want to tell you, really, I don't come onto the class so often because I teach all day and then I have other obligations. But every time I come on, you really inspire me with the work that you do and the Torah that you bring to the entire world. And I really want to thank you, Chaya, for dedicating this class to the memory of my very dear brother, and uh, whose 26th yard site is today, Dala Tevis. And actually, when you said the words that we just come to this world for 70, 80 years to do a favor for another, my brother actually did favors for much less than that. In 52 years, he was the most kind and amazing person that one can come across. He always used to tell everybody, don't be too good, that good die young. And then we all said when he passed away so young, we knew exactly what he was saying. And um, I just want to tell you how your Bubby is very proud of you. I was listening very carefully to everything you say. And actually, when you introduced my brother with his favorite saying that the best of last year should be the worst of this year, I started chuckling to myself because I was the first person that my brother said it to. And I said, Chaim, what are you saying to me? And he says, why did you stop and think? What did I say to you? And I said to him, Chaim, that's the most awesome bracha that you can possibly give to a person. The best, the best of last year should be the worst of this year. Anyways, um, I'll, I have stories to tell about during Shiva, these people that we met, these disheveled people who came in and saying, is this the home of Chaim Lipsker? And my brother Chaim lived in New Rochelle. So it was not easy to get to his house during Shiva. And they all came in to tell us of how he supported them weekly and he, they would wait on a corner. And they all knew that something was wrong because Chaim wasn't there to give them their weekly stipend so they would have food to eat. My brother Chaim had a very, very special connection to the Rebbe and to my grandfather. My, he was probably my grandfather's favorite grandchild. He was his first grandchild. And in Russia, not too many people had grandchildren. And he really had a very special connection with him. When my uh, grandfather, about a few weeks before my grandfather actually passed away, he had a heart attack. And at that time, my, they were living in Crown Heights, my grandfather, and they put him into Brookdale Hospital. Uh, And my brother was very upset about it. He did not like the idea of that hospital. He was more of the Manhattan type. He felt that the hospitals in Manhattan were much better. Now, every day, the Rebbe was a good friend of my grandfather's. And my grandfather was a very good friend of the Rebbe's. And by Mincha time, the Rebbe would be, um, somebody from our family would be standing outside And the Rebbe would pass by and stop in front of the person, whether it was my uncle or my father or my brother, and want to get the daily report about my grandfather. My brother, Olav Shalom Chaim, decided he needs to speak to the Rebbe. 
He goes to the hospital every day. He's not happy with what's going on. He needs to speak to the Rebbe. So he goes by and the Rebbe, he's standing there waiting for the Rebbe and uh, the Rebbe is waiting for the report. And my brother Chaim looks at the Rebbe and he says, I would like my grandfather to be transferred to a hospital in Manhattan, but the family won't do it unless the Rebbe allows. And the Rebbe just, and, and the Rebbe just continues listening. And then he says again, I would like my grandfather to be transferred to a hospital in Manhattan. My brother, I don't know if he was a chassan yet, but he was almost becoming a chassan then. He was, I think, 25 years old, my brother Chaim. And the Rebbe looked at him and he didn't answer and the Rebbe just kept walking. My grandfather um, passed very shortly afterwards and my brother was a chassan. And in those times when you were married, right before, a few weeks before you were getting married, you went in for a private audience to the Rebbe. And my brother and his kala then, Carol, they went in for a private audience. And you know, the Rebbe gives the bracha and then my brother says, I'm, I'm ask, I need to ask the Rebbe a question. So he said to the Rebbe, when I passed by you and asked you to transfer my grandfather to the, the, um, to the hospital in Manhattan, you refused to answer me. But you said to me, the Rebbe is going, the Zayda, excuse me, the Zayda v'tansun badir afchasene. Your grandfather will be dancing at your wedding. My grandfather is not alive. The Rebbe looked straight into my brother's eyes and he said, did you invite your grandfather to the wedding? And my brother looked at the Rebbe like, uh, what you, he didn't even know what to say. So the Rebbe says, how do you expect your grandfather to come if you don't even invite him? You have to go to him. You have to knock three times on his stone, bring him an invitation and tell him that you would like him to come to your wedding. Like my brother tells the story then, he's not sure how much he believed in that at that point. He was very disappointed. And he felt that had my father, my grandfather been at a better hospital, this would not have happened. But he still did that. He went to the, he went to um, my Zayda and he, he knocked three times. He said Zayda to come to his wedding. Uh, a few weeks later, he gets married, and my brother was known, even at his own wedding, he always brought two or three shirts to a wedding. He loved to be Misameach. He loved to dance, and he needed a few shirts because as soon as one became drenched from dancing, he should have another shirt to put on. My brother Shalom was standing next to him as he was dancing. He sees my brother Chaim, all of a Shalom, turning white. He says, Shalom, come here quick. He says, are you feeling okay? He says, Shalom, I don't know if you're going to believe me. Zaidi was just at my wedding. I was just dancing with Zaidi. Zaidi came to my wedding. And from then on, it became the minhag, I don't know what you call it, of our family. The before a simcha, before we ask anybody, even before we go, when we go to the Rebbe, to knock three times, to bring an invitation or to ask them whatever is on our heart. Now, this story actually has a sequel that I don't know if many people know it, but about 15 years later, my father, my father, Olva Shalom, was not feeling well right after Simchas Torah. My father would be in New York every year for Simchas Torah. And my brother said right away, my father doesn't feel well. My brother Chaim, he had connections to the biggest cardiologist in Manhattan, in Mount Sinai Hospital. He takes my father there. And you know, they, my brother's there and the doctor says, no, your father's okay. Um, he could go back home to Toronto, everything will be fine. And as my brother tells the story, as the doctor is saying he can go home, my father says, a pain. And my father's neshama left the world in a split second. We had the biggest cardiologist there. You had every surgeon there. You had every machine there. And my brother would always tell us then, that 15 or 17 years later, he got the real message that the Rebbe was telling us. We're not gonna control when, where, how, and how long. Everything is in the hands of the Eberster. And he said, to, he said to us afterwards, what did dad even have to go to the hospital for to find out that he's feeling fine? 
to tell all of us and me, my brother taught us, that everything is in the hands of the Eberster. Um, my brother was a brilliant man to the point that one time when my parents actually went in for Yechidas, the Rebbe said to my father, a brain like this is born once in a century. And we were lucky enough to have the special person as our brother. And as much as it's wonderful to feel that we go and we knock and we know it every, at every um, simcha, we always say the souls of three generations come to be with us at a simcha. Let us hope and pray that very soon we will have everybody here in person and we will be able to rejoice with one another, our family and the Rebbe Bereisham in a physical revealed way. Thank you, Chaya, for allowing me to share. Uh, thank you, Sheva, for sharing. I'm so glad that story is out now because it's something that I always tell people and they always think I'm making it up. They're like, oh, you're into all this uh, Kool-Aid, but it's a true story. And um, I hope that everyone feels our loved, loved ones with them. And I hope that we get to see them all very soon with the coming of Mashiach. Um, thank you, Sheva. Your brother is surely proud of you. And I'm sure uh, he's with you in a different kind of way, but he's always by your side. Um, thank you for sharing. We're going to conclude with a video. And after the video, uh, if anyone wants to share any connection that they have to the Hey Teves, there's some people on here that would like to share. Please, you, you can unmute yourself and we will um, open up the floor to anyone who would like to share. So we're going to conclude with a video. Kaifen Mais for him, or the Paris and Altis for him, or the German dem Dollar at Zweiten Lied, as a Zweiter Result, is nutzen das, ab der Mitzvah Amuro. Apostel, die Kinder, 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 die That was so special. Thanks for sharing. Um, if anyone would like to unmute themselves and share something about Hey Tevis, you can now before we conclude. Osheva. I just want, I just was reading some of the comments. Somebody wanted to know who my grandfather was. My grandfather was Reb Zalman Duchman. Somebody and asked Reb, on. And Reb Zalman Duchman was my, we're, we're related, was my grandfather's first cousin. My grandmother, his wife. His wife. His wife was your grandfather's first cousin, yes. Beautiful. His, his neshama should have the highest aliyah. I think, well. no, I think actually my grandmother was your grandfather's aunt. They used to call her Mumagrun, you know, yes. We're getting a family. Your, history. my mother, 
and your yeah yeah so cute okay. if anyone has any questions or comments uh we have a few more minutes um please unmute yourself arlene yes hi i just want to tell you something very interesting that happened to me last week um i went on a cruise from rio to buenos aires and I happened to be in Buenos Aires when Argentina won the World Cup. And that was really, really exciting. And then I got on the plane and next to me was sitting a man who was obviously Orthodox. And we chatted a bit. And then he said, I think, I think you should sit next to my wife. And I realized what he was saying was that he shouldn't be sitting next to me. So I sat next to his wife. And for 11 hours, I slept and, and I talked to this woman for 11 hours. And it was just absolutely wonderful, you know, sharing with her things, you know, um, you know, that I've gone through in my life, you know, being a Jew. And then at one point I got up to go to the bathroom. When I came back, they had served me a kosher meal. And I said, oh, how did this get here? She goes, I don't know, but you know, just eat it. And I had the kosher meal and it was better than what everybody else got. And, and she said to me, just order a kosher meal. It's always better. So you know what, lesson learned, I'm gonna order a kosher meal. But I just wanted to say that it was just wonderful talking to this woman for the whole flight home. And I never even turned on you know, a movie or music or anything. We just talked the whole trip and it was really, really nice, you know, to share with her about being a Jew. Thanks, Arlene, for sharing. You are a really special Jew and we're so lucky. For those that don't know, Arlene works in Trader Joe's um, <laughs> more as a hobby and um, she loves it. And she tells everybody that comes in what's kosher, what they can have, the new products. Um, I got to, when I was living in Brooklyn Heights, I got to uh, go to Trader Joe's very often. And I would see Arlene super often. And she was just a familiar face with such a beautiful aura and kindness. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. It matters just to be kind and nice and you know, you never know how you're going to affect someone's day. So Absolutely. thank you for everything that you do for everyone and always sharing such beautiful encounters and stories with us and being such a huge part of this class. So thank you. And if anyone else you. wants to unmute. We also have, I, I just want to say we have, it's a big networking. We have four broadcasts now on on um, that I just send out. And now so many of you share the class. It's on so many statuses and it's on so many groups. And I feel like when Jews come together, we should uh, inspire, help. And it's a really good time to take on something. But I also, someone in the chat box uh, asked if anyone has any ideas for a date for her. And she's an amazing girl. So if anyone on here is a matchmaker, to please reach out to me and I will get you her information so we can try to help everyone and everyone should have everything that they need in their life. It's a really, really special year of Hakel and everyone should be blessed with health, happiness, joy, inner peace. Um, you should find your loved ones. Those that are waiting for children should have children. Those who, are, who need Parnassa uh, sustenance and livelihood should have it in abundance and it should just happen so easy for everyone. And it's so easy for Hashem. And if, if he sees that we're helping others, he usually answers us first. So if everyone can please uh, reach out to me if you have any um, ideas and I will get you her resume. It will be really special. If anyone else would like to unmute themselves, please do to share. And then we're going to conclude. Hi. How are you? I normally, Hi. I normally don't go on video, but I, I definitely was in a space and a time to do so. I want to just honor your relative and yourself. And I wrote down the, that this probably be something that I will share in their memory. Um, the best of last year should be the worst of this year for everyone going forward. And even though we know we had Rosh Hashanah and the year is already in swing for the new year coming for, you know, the American new year, I can definitely see myself texting this 
and using it going forward as a wish. So I honor your family for that. And um, I thank you for that share because it's incredibly rich. And, and that's right on the Rebbe's philosophy of thinking good for it to be good, just continuously flowing in that mindset. So Yasha Koach to you and your family. And thank you for the synergy of putting this together for all of the energy on the chat. So it's, it's beautiful. So every bracha for you. Thank you, Randy. And can you tell us where you're from? Sure. Originally from Brooklyn. So I always love to say that Brooklyn girl by heart. Right now I'm in Long Island. Beautiful. Welcome, welcome. We have a roll call. So I just, sure. I think we'll just be fine. A few people put posted in the chat. We have uh, ladies from Brooklyn Heights. We have Los Angeles. We have Baltimore. We have uh, Bay Harbor, Florida. We have Long Island, Mexico, Baltimore, Roslyn, New Jersey, Brazil, um, and so many other places if I didn't mention, but we have South Africa. Connecticut. Connecticut. We have South Africa and Israel waiting for the recordings. Who else is on here? Just unmute yourself and tell us so we can know. It's such a beautiful Barack class. Away. Barack away. Beautiful. Welcome. Welcome. Um, it's such a beautiful class. I call it. It's a challenge of Jews like the Kotel. We have every kind of person on here and I love it. Please keep sharing this class. Uh, we now have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe. We have past classes. We're going to be posting old classes pretty soon. And um, thank you everyone for helping with the class. Before the class started, I thanked Hakara Satova. I'm just gonna do it real fast again because I see some of them on. Thank you, Shandy. Thank you, Joelle. Thank you, Bracha. Thank you, Esti. And thank you to our amazing attendants. And thank you to Hashem and the Rebbe for making this happen because it's pretty amazing that it's going. Cause Zoom, the Zoom world kind of, no one really likes to Zoom. People like to be, in person, but every single week, I mean, tonight we had 77 ladies. That's pretty in incredible. Um, my dear friend Shandy said that it's not 70. usual. So um, it's really, really incredible. And i um, looking forward to seeing you all next week. We have amazing classes. Next week's class is not gonna be recorded. So if you wanna come on live, come on live. It's gonna be a great class. Uh, it's a private class. Uh, someone's gonna be sharing their journey and they don't want it recorded. So please uh, spread the word that if you snooze, you lose. Um, <laughs> and um, good night, everyone. So Hi, I just want to say, life. this is, you're really bringing Mashiach closer. It's pretty amazing what you're doing here. Just out of your own goodwill, good heart and desire for Mashiach, you're just putting yourself into it. It's pretty amazing. Mashiach now, Leo, guys. Thank you Beautiful. so much for being here. I just want to say that I really Thanks. harassed Leia a lot to speak for months. And um, Hashem knows when it's the right time. So thank you for coming on. And you only know about this class if you're on. So there's nothing like being live. Recordings are great, but live, no one could see who's on. Um, I see my friend, Mrs. Baltiel. Hi, so happy to see you. Thank you everyone for putting on your screens. It's so special. And um, in a few weeks, we're gonna be celebrating our two year anniversary of this class. And if anyone was inspired um, by this class, we have a couple of speakers that are going to be sharing their personal journeys and their personal inspiration. Please reach out to me so I can add you onto uh, that class. It's people that have been coming on weekly that are going to be sharing, but we're looking forward to having you all again. Good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank keep you. The, keep the light in your life. And if Shane, if you're on, I'm I'm just going to ask you to share a beautiful quote because it's something that you shared. Um, I'm not sure if I see Shandy, but um, there's a there's a quote that says, um, "Be the light." At the end of the tunnel, there's there's light, right? You go into a tunnel, you drive. There's beautiful light, but what about in the dark tunnel? We need to be the we need to be the light in the tunnel in the darkness. We need to, and it's so easy. We just have to turn the light on, smile at your friend, be there for your friend, call a friend. Just inspire, be the reason someone smiles today. Because at the end of the day, um, it's it's not rocket science, but when someone is going through a hard time, when you volunteer and when you do good deeds for others, it automatically uplifts your life and it Absolutely. brings joy and light in your life. So yep. if everyone can please uh, take that on to be the light in your own life, um, we're in Gullus, but we can be the light in Gullus. And very soon with the coming of Mashiach, we're going to all dance together. And this class, we're going to have a little 
beautiful uh, reunion in person. It's just hard. Someone asked me why we don't do this class in person. Uh, it's just because everyone's from all over the place. But um, I hope very soon when Mashiach comes, we will be together um, in person. Right, can I tell you something so sweet that you just, I'm going to share it. Sure. Can you another minute? You do? Sure. Okay. So I have, Baruch Hashem, I have two daughters. I was out with one of my daughters and major class on time, but we were out in a public space. And you know what she said? She was smiling and she said, mom, you know what? It really makes me, un it makes me comfortable when I smile at someone and they smile back. And she mm -hmm. said, I don't understand why when I smile at someone, they're not smiling back at me. And you just are flowing into this whole theme, basically. And I absolutely love our Trader Joe people because their culture is exactly that. You feel like you want to take them all home. So I understand exactly <laughs> what you're talking about, but out of the mouth of our children. If I know we all carry things in our lives that sometimes are very heavy, but eye contact and a smile can absolutely change absolutely someone's does. feeling and make you feel so much safer in, in the eyes of adults and children. So Chaya, thank you so much for that understanding about being the light. It's so simple, so simple. One mm -hmm. of the, and it's one of the greatest things I learned in yeshiva. I'll never forget my Rebbe said, what is free? And again, you're bringing me through to this and thank you. And everyone had different thoughts, water, this, that, the other. And of course, you know what the Rav, the Rav said, your smile. So thank you, Chaya, for that. And thank you for letting me know that Hashem is speaking through you to ensure that we just look at each other in this world and smile. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, Randy. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you.